Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of VCTV. I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott, and we've got a very fun and exciting episode for you today. We're going to be talking about the Industrial 4.0, the Information Age, Industrial Revolution, the fourth version of this, and what it means, what's happening, what's not happening, but more specifically, what's going on around robotics and manufacturing. How do these two industries play a role in this industrial 4.0, but also what technologies are powering them to be successful, to go from what has been so traditional and leading the industrial revolutions from one to two to three to now four, what's changing? How are we gonna take these particular industries, robotics and manufacturing and bring them into this information age and so much more. So get ready. We've brought the best and the brightest from around the world in these areas to share just that with you today. But before we get started, a big thank you to you, our audience, for tuning in. If you like what you heard, click subscribe. Love to hear uh, hear from you as well. So if you'd like to reach out, please do. We'd love to have you on a show like today's as well, joining other investors to speak about various industries, regions, or technologies around the world. Do reach out to the team and or myself, and we'd love to find the right set of topics, but also investors for you to join as well. Entrepreneurs, virtual stage here for you at VCTV. Guess what? It's an opportunity for you to get up on and pitch us as investors to get real-time feedback on your company product or service, along with building foundational relationships with each and every one of us and get exposure to our live audience. Do reach out to the team and or myself. We'd love to find the right spot for you. Last but not least, that team. A big, big thank you to the LA Token team and to Maria for making VCTV possible every single day and being able to bring all of us together to have such great discussions. With that, let's go ahead and get started as your host. I'm Kyle Ellicott. Let's introduce each and every one of our great panelists. The man with a plan, the man with a little jazz in his step, beautiful, wonderful hat today. Jose, welcome back to the show. Hi, Kyle. Uh, so, so wonderful to be here again on your show. And uh, so I'm Jose Grasa. I've been a uh, serial entrepreneur now for 40 years, 26 years as a business angel, uh, more or less like three years like a VC. Uh, I always say this because it's true. I, I, I'm much more excited of being an entrepreneur than being an uh, investor. And the, the reason for that is because I like to build brands and I like to build things. I like seeing, to see those things coming out. And um, the investor mindset is very different from an uh, entrepreneur's mindset. Although the goal at the end is uh, the same, it's making money. And um, uh, I like to do this uh, on a full-time basis, more or less. And uh, I'm really happy and excited to be on this show today because it's about robotics. So, and the panel here, uh, Gary Fowler and uh, Keith uh, Gillard, you know, quite a, a very good panel that uh, we are excited to, to be on today. Absolutely. We're excited to have you. And again, love, love the hat, uh, as we talked about off pre-show. Uh, um, but uh, with that being said... A little dramatic pause. I'll come back to that next introduction. Keith, welcome back to the show. A little bit of tropics in your step there today. I see you, you might be coming, calling in from Hawaii. You might be calling from Vancouver. I don't know. Give us a little intro, a little background. <laughs> hey, Kyle. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so I've been in VC for 20 years, and um, uh, a lot of that has been focused on uh, clean tech um, and, and Industry 4.0, uh, particularly the last well, 10, maybe even 15 years of that. Um, I started off in Mitsubishi Corporation, then as president of BASF Venture Capital America, and then 10 years with Pangea Ventures, uh, launching uh, Funds 3 and Fund 4 there. Um, <clears throat> I've had a great deal of interest in Industry 4.0, and because my career has been so focused on um, chemical and materials, I've been very focused on, on process and um, and the material impact it can have uh, in this space. Um, I've now launched a new firm called Upper Stage Ventures, and our focus is supply chain and industry 4.0. Um, this is a hu huge impact here uh, in terms of automation, the integration of sensors, AI, and machine learning into the manufacturing and logistics space. Um, very very excited about the possibilities there. Absolutely. Throw data on top of that, throw the future of connectivity as we um, have also kind of started to touch on edge and 5G and the future of all of that connectivity, what that's going to entail as well. Absolutely excited to dive into this. Last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, Gary Fowler. 
Grandmaster of Artificial Intelligence, the one who has the data and the knowledge to share with us today. Gary, it's welcome so great back to, to the show. Be here, Kyle. You are the Nostradamus of tech, the man of a thousand passions, the all seeing eye. I'm not worthy. I like the all seeing eye one. I like that. I like that. I like that a lot. It makes me feel good. It's good to, good to be here today. My name is Gary Fowler, and I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've done 16 companies, uh, two unicorns. I love AI in all kinds of places. Um, love where it's being applied, manufacturing, healthcare. I mean, you name it. I love transport away AI miles. I just, by the way, Kyle wrote an article on blockchain and quantum computing today. That is just getting ready to be public. So my AI and ethics Forbes said has uh, been approved. So you'll see that soon. So I listened to what we were saying on some of these shows and I started to write about it. So love it. anyhow, uh, I love tech. We're an investor. We have a hundred million dollar impact fund. We have 18 portfolio companies today and it's about spreading the word. We've been spreading the word quite a bit. Um, through our shows and through the events that we have. So it's, uh, it's great to be here. I appreciate it. I love this digital platform. I remember in the beginning, Kyle, seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? <laughs> I feel like Jack Nixon. Well, it seems like a long time ago. <laughs> but it was at the beginning, back in the days when you couldn't get toilet paper. You remember those days, Kyle? <laughs> I do. I do. That's but for the audience doesn't know. That's when Gary and I first met each other. We we both couldn't they buy toilet pretty, paper. Uh, something or other. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's crazy to see where we've come as we're heading into the end of, of 2020 here. I mean, where the year started to where we all had the chance to, you know, be introduced to VCTV and have this platform really get created and flourish, bringing not just all of us together, but bringing such great knowledge around different technologies, industries, and regions around the world to so many. It's It's been such a pleasure. Uh, and I mean, where else could you meet people like Christopher Altman, a guy that's a PhD in quantum physics, has studied the UFOs at a very deep level as a NASA astronaut, you know, uh, the number one fitness guy in the world, listed most fit guy in the world. I mean, just Jose's here, Keith's here. I mean, it's amazing. I just love it. And I love jazz too, by the way. So it's just, it's amazing. I got to tell you, it's truly amazing. I've met some of the most successful, wealthiest people in the world who are, have come into these events incognito. And once I got to know them, I understood they were from some of the wealthiest family offices on the planet Earth. It's amazing, right? I mean, we're, we're very, very fortunate and I, very lucky to bring together. It's hard to believe when you start to go down through it. Oh, yes, um, I might, I'm representing my German family office. Oh, really? And I'm not going to say who it is. And <laughs> But, you know, when you have the heir to one of the, um, I don't want to say too much, but one of the big German companies, sometimes they have three initials, uh, you know, I mean, it's incredible. And, you know, the, the way their passion for tech is, the ideas that they have, their passions, uh, uh, her particular passion is get out of the big com company that she was in their, their company, but come out and look for innovation. And she said in a broken German, I've learned so much. <laughs> You know, oh, <laughs> I'm very detail oriented. Okay. <laughs> it's, but it's, it's interesting. A, it is. And it's amazing how those transitions happen and how technology plays a role. And it, it's a perfect transition to this industry 4.0 because we look at those four, uh, those three previous revolutions as technology has played a role into the advancement of the industrial uh, setting or age that we're in. And now we look towards this next one, Industrial 4.0, driven by data. I mean, Keith called it out around sensors. I mean, we've got so much that plays a role into this, but it's a huge transformation. And it's something we're, we're, we're almost, I think if I look at the dates, we're about 20, 25 years into it, which doesn't seem like it, but realistically, it feels like it's just beginning. Uh, and so we'd love to hear from each of you what you see as the Industrial 4.0, how you see this today as, as we move into really what I believe, and I think we've all talked about here on VCTV, is the, one of the most transformative decades in front of us uh, here in, in 2020. So Jose, let's kick it off with you. Thank you, Gary, for perfect transition. Uh, current state, what you're currently seeing as Industrial 4.0 today. Well, I think I have a different vision uh, uh, on this subject. 
also because I, I work in a different area. So uh, my concern is uh, something that I call business inclusion and uh, which touches more or less uh, two individuals in every 10 individuals on a global scale. And it's, it's massive. I can tell it's massive. And um, what I see in, in the uh, new industrial revolution is that it looks like for the first time in, in humanity that more or less we will be able to do this shift from um, becoming an executioner into a real decision maker, essentially a decision maker. So having uh, robots more or less taking over uh, in the industrial process, which is already quite advanced including in agriculture. I don't think people even imagine how advanced agriculture is today that you have a whole line, you know, just uh, in different layers, you, you, because you, you don't need to plant it in, inside the soil, right? You can just have water going through the roots in different layers, you're fully automatic, even the, the crop uh, taking out, you know, it's fully automatic. And all this, I can tell you one thing, which with the, um, the 5G, okay, it's, 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 it's nothing, right? So we are going to face probably like 10G or in, in the next, uh, you know, five years or maybe less. But the speed, how data is going to flow and the amount of processing capacity that we will have and the development, which is getting faster with people's development, like no code, okay? Just drag and drop and building those processes. And having that, that massive power will propel us in such a way that we cannot imagine today what it will be in the next five years. I can tell you that. It will be massive. Um, not only the artificial intelligence that we need behind it, but also the machine learning. And blockchain, of course, it has a part in, in that puzzle, but not only. But in essence, what I would like to try to make open to the public more or less that people start thinking is how this all will be if we suddenly you know which is what we are doing with this business inclusion automation is that have 75 percent more time available every day to do and and to have the lifestyle that we want to have while at the same time we are building a business and we have our financial independence and we are all part of a big puzzle which is decentralized so i will leave it like that and um I think my, my, my panel members today, which are uh, quite uh, sublime, they, they will have a completely different uh, view and area that they want to touch for sure. But the, the term you throw out there, thank you, Jose, the term you throw out there, business inclusion, this is a very important topic I want to come back on because it is something you do focus very heavily and it does play a very big role in this next uh, information wave that we go into um, because of some of the things that you just mentioned. But before we come back to that, uh, Keith, same question to you. What are you seeing? What's getting you excited about this next industry 4.0 as a? Right. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm really excited in in robotics about the um, uh, about the the breakthroughs going on in end effectors. Uh, of course, we have all this uh, machine vision uh, that is allowing uh, for um, the robotic systems to know. The more about the environment that they're in, et cetera. But once their end effector is actually holding something, you can no longer see it. So uh, um, sensors that are built into the end effector allow for uh, a high degree of not, not just understanding what is going on within the system, but uh, also for finer control. Um, I, I got very excited uh, about a, um, a, a company that has a, well, you've heard of machine vision, of course, but machine touch that uh, for high resolution, uh, um, uh, essentially it's a kind of vision, but uh, like what we have in our fingertips. So that not only does it know that it is holding something, but it knows exactly where it is holding it, how it is holding it. If it's applying too much pressure to actually uh, uh, start to deform, or if it's too little pressure and it's starting to slip, and all of that feeding back into AI that is then controlling the, uh, the motors on the end effector to hold it precisely. Uh, with, with this kind of control, uh, not only can you be doing things in logistics, that's easy stuff, but now machines uh, become possible to uh, actually assemble 
finer and finer things and not just robots that are welding joints, et cetera, which we've had for decades, but to do uh, real uh, fine controlled work, do it quickly and precisely with quality control uh, coming in through those sensors at every step of the way. Um, I think there's really great breakthroughs going on in this, not just in the sensors, but in the, on the AI side with what the software can do with all that extra information. Wow. So are you actually seeing companies building on this right now? I mean, have you had a chance to integrate or uh, uh, play with this at some point? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I have uh, one of these end effectors here. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really uh, amazing stuff to, to play with. I mean, it really, uh, uh, it appeals to the kid in me for sure. Uh, uh, just getting in there and taking a, taking a look at what surfaces look like uh, in, in yeah. great detail up close, uh, just like a kid with a micro microscope, I'm having fun. But the practical applications are very exciting and going beyond uh, industry 4.0, if I can apply my, my vision here, the kind of stuff yeah. that really gets me excited as we move into an era in the future of household robots that do more than just sweep our floors, um, uh, having something that can feed uh, the, the elderly or dress them or uh, uh, assist in, in, in ways that you need fingers to do and uh, you don't want them going in the eye <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or or pinching or hurting uh, people, um, uh, the, these kind of sensors will be completely necessary. And I believe there's a really exciting future for that. But as I said in previous shows, I no longer, I hope, invest in future markets. I invest in markets that exist right now. And manufacturing uh, needs these things right now. So there, I think we can make a lot of money and, in, and uh, exit these companies on the promise of what they can do in the future for uh, personal household robots. And this touches a little bit of what Jose mentioned and, and you're calling out, right? I mean, when it comes to manufacturing, that was the first thing I thought of as you were describing this is being able to pick up fruit, for instance, um, out of a assembly line as it's coming in and doing QA. So doing the, the quantitative analysis of just saying like, yes, no, yes, no. Um, and being able to pick up that, that tomato without bruising it. I mean, that, that changes dramatically the, not just the manufacturing, but that entire value chain hey, and how take, things get put look, together. Take a look uh, online. There's a great video. The company's name is Gel Sight. Um, gel, G-E-L, and Sight like vision. Um, and uh, you can see a video of them using uh, these uh, sensors um, to determine which fruit are ripe and which ones are not. Uh, not, just, not just handling them appropriately, but being able to tell from the squishiness, the same way that you do when you go to the grocery store, is this yeah. ripe? Is this ready to eat? The robot can tell that. It's, it's really amazing. I mean, I, being the host, I get the chance to uh, browse a little bit to make sure we fact check things. And I definitely just did. It's amazing. Just the videos I saw very quickly, the previews look very awesome. So thank you. Thank very you, cool. Keith. And that's, that's a perfect segue you, to you, Gary. I, I mean, this is something we need to put into, uh, we need to get from Morpheus. I mean, Morpheus needs to have this, uh, this new human touch or this sensitive touch feature built into it. But before we get to Morpheus and why that's so important, uh and, and and what that is uh your view industrial 4.0 what are you seeing what are you thinking yeah so where you know look at where we are today so in a factory imagine communications between systems between robots cobots i mean it's really the integration of this smart factory actually you know i don't think it's a smart factory i think it's an intelligent factory there's a difference. These things can start to predict. So I love it because now the systems become more integrated. It makes it highly, highly efficient. So think about these cyber physical systems and the relationships that they have with one another, how they, they're synchronized and how they can adapt and think about what it does to uh, defects in the manufacturing process using computer vision. The difference is everything's connected together. Then you take predictive maintenance, 3D printing, smart sensors, you know, and you're combining it together. This is incredible. Think about how it reduces the uh, amount of uh, challenges we have, defects within a particular plant, because you're taking a lot of the human pieces out. 
The other thing is uh, I wrote an article on universal basic income, and we're moving in that direction very, very quickly because how many people are going to be needed in the planet? I mean, there's, there's other issues that we have on top of it, but I love it. And, you know, the thing that was really interesting to me, Kyle, I saw a couple of years ago, 3D printers building themselves. I saw a school in Armenia called Tumo, where they actually had 3D printers that were actually building 3D printers, creating 3D printers. And when I saw that, I thought, this is what the future is going to be, right? So imagine robots building robots, right? And we're not that far away. The beauty is, you know, if we do this right, this fourth industrial revolution is here. And what we have to be careful is, you know, that we train these systems. I talked about it a number of times. I've written articles about compassionate AI, but be careful how, you know, be careful what you wish for. Make sure your training sets are right. You don't want to have some rogue uh, Skynet kind of situation develop. And then the issue with cybersecurity, by the way, when we have this much online, I just had uh, two of the top cybersecurity, two of the top security experts in the world yesterday that I interviewed, Rick Orloff, the former chief security officer at Apple, and uh, Dave Luno, one of the top uh, illicit trade technology security guys in the world. And we were talking directly about it. I mean, it, on one side, we've got these great opportunities, but we need to protect and um, have an AI and, and quantum computers <laughs> is one of the ways that we can do it. Although, you know, those systems shortly, I'm going to my, one of my articles coming out is about uh, cybersecurity and quantum computing. And I'm not sure cybersecurity is going to be that much in vogue anymore once we get online with the uh, quantum computers, but. Anyhow, that's another that's another uh, show, but I, I love it and I think that you know this the 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 challenges of companies that don't keep up and don't mm -hmm. automate at this level are going to lose because these systems are going to be so efficient that they're going to be able to think about pre D three D printing on a massive scale car parts. I have a three D printing company today that does carbon uh, parts today, right? So imagine how this is going to change. Keith, it looked like you had a you had a point there. Did you want to chime? No, in? Gary, I, I I love you talking about quantum computers. Uh, I, I'm a I'm I'm an angel investor in D-Wave. Um, uh, I've been actively following uh, everything that's going on in the quantum world. And as you start to bring in the optimization that's possible with quantum computers into an industrial setting, uh, and and to talk about 3D printing there, for example, um, you can come up with optimal ways to structure a part. Uh, as light as possible with as little material as possible and yet have great resilience and great strength uh, and for uh, whatever properties that part needs to have. Um, quantum computers can get you to that optimal uh, design very quickly and they often look nothing at all like what a human would come up with. Um, yet uh, they, they are the ideal way to, uh, to print such a part. I'm very excited about that. Uh, and as we get into a future where this kind of distributed manufacturing is available everywhere, um, we're, going to see, um, we're going to see such an explosion of, of, of parts um, that we will not be able to keep up with the number of SKUs. <laughs> There's going to be so many unique parts for each particular purpose. Uh, and um, so many things can just be bespoke and they're getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, when you can do a, a better job with a bespoke part and not have a, a burdensome economic impact on your cost basis, um, everything's gonna move in that direction. Um, we're gonna become less less standardized, which is, uh, uh, which is a strange thing to think about because of the way that th things have gone over the last century. But um, I do believe we're going to that more and more bespoke manufacturing uh, methods and parts. What's the interim step, Keith? What, where do we go for now? Because you invest in markets today, not invest in markets in the future. So, you know, with manufacturing and robotics, I mean, you're mentioning, you know, more SKUs than we can keep up with. You know, AI and machine learning will play a huge role in that. But for you, I mean, what's what do we invest in today? What do we look at today uh, that exists to, to prepare for that? 
Sure. Well, I mean, in the in-between step, uh, um, to take what you said literally, the, the in-between step between uh, mass manufacturing and absolutely bespoke uh, um, uh, parts uh, is this step of small batch parts that have um, not been economic uh, uh, to date, um, generally tend to be used for very um, cost insensitive applications like military um, or, or scientific um, application space, et cetera. Um, um, but metal uh, 3D printing in particular allows you to get to um, these small batch parts um, um, with better material properties um, and almost as economically as, uh, as injection molding would. The thing is the mold has a very high level of cost to, uh, to make it. So um, if you're going to do injection molding, um, you'd better be sure that you're gonna produce um, X thousand or even millions of, of parts because the, the molds themselves are very expensive and it's very hard to get over the hurdle of that upfront cost. 3D printing um, gets around that entirely. You do have a higher cost per part, but you avoid the need to make that, uh, to make that mold. Um, up until recently though, 3D printing lacked the, uh, the, the material properties in terms of strength. Um, and if you're talking about plastic parts um, in particular, um, the Z axis strength, uh, the X and Y each plane of things very, very strong uh, in this direction. But as each thing gets layered on top of each other, the uh, strength in the Z axis is, is really weak. Um, if you think about shale, for example, in terms of, of rock, and you think about how easily shale comes apart into plates, you, you have the same kind of weakness into any part that was printed in that way. And surface finish. They, they, you tend to be able to look at something and, and say, oh yeah, that was 3D printed. I can tell because it's kind of a pixely edge. I can see uh, how they did things uh, layer by layer. Um, uh, that is becoming less and less the case as people are addressing this. And we're getting into low cost laser sintering. We're getting into low cost uh, uh, approaches that are um, producing a very smooth finish. Um, uh, to the outside of something. And we're not just talking about high resolution with pixels so small you can't see them, but actual um, uh, smoothing of that surface to create low friction and beautiful parts. Interesting. And, and with that, uh, Jose, coming back to you, uh, you know, anything to add, but also want to dive a level deeper into robotics. This is an area you focus very heavily on, you love. Talk to us a little bit more, again, any follow-up to Keith, but then tell us a little bit more about robotics and what you're seeing there. Well, I have a personal experience in robotics. You know, mm -hmm. I was a uh, clothing manufacturer for like 10 years and I was trying to uh, put the whole uh, production line into robotics. Now, the big problem at that stage was that um, the, the touch, you know, was a real, real headache. And the change of the, uh, of the, of the production line, which could, you, you, the problem is you, you want to get out of mono production into flexible production because today it's one thing or it's another thing and the orders also uh, go differently so you need to behave be able to adapt a lot and th there was no way uh, to solve that issue because robotics at that time was not so far advanced that you had this touch sensibility you know that people have still when touching the clothing etc by the way there's something which is very interesting which touches this i think it's just interesting to mention it when we do a handshake, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our cells never touch each other. What happens is that it's proven that it, we, the cells don't touch each other, they're the skin cells. So what happens is that we have the feeling that it touches, but it's the pressure that you feel. Because between the two cells, there is a tiny space, okay? It's like a membrane, right? Or a vacuum that, does, that makes it that it doesn't touch. Now, the recent study about this, right? And maybe, you know, there is the solution uh, for to solve this robotics issue because at, in essence, what you want is that you feel the pressure and the touch, how you're going to manage it. Either if it's a tomato, you know, or, or, or you know, a, a skin of clothing or whatever it is, right? Uh, so um, um, did, maybe this is a solution. I think the gel was a very good keen uh, way, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that was my experience. Eventually, I, I went into um, 
uh, software development because I found it much more exciting. As I told you, I, I like to uh, be, be more focused on business inclusion because that's an active, uh, real problem. It's not future telling, it's just what happens today. And robotics, in essence, the, the way I look at it is the following. The future okay, will be that we need less and less people to do whatever we want. Either it's, it's a piece of metal that we want to produce or whatever it is, or a whole factory. So at the end, you know, machines more or less will take over. And you need, sure, you need still people to, uh, let's say, control it and manage it up to a certain point. But you don't need people on the floor to execute it, right? So my concern is to get people from execution into soft skills, which is creativity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Einstein said it very well. You know, he said, real intelligence is not about what you memorize. It's about how creative you are to solve things. Right. And that's where I'm focused on. Okay. On the creative solutions of things, because that's where humanity in future will have a huge add on. If you have all these you know, millions of people available, right. That's you know, just unemployed or nothing have to do. And you put them on soft skills, on solving problems, you know, moving us forward, right? Mm -hmm. Then suddenly you, you get this in a very high speed. Now, whatever you do in, in, in that part, you still have one problem that you need to solve, is how are you going to get them included into the whole process? And that's what I call business inclusion. And that's uh, what I'm working on, is trying to get them involved in the whole process in a very fast, short learning curve instead of more or less, let's say, what we still have today, uh, two to five years to kick off any company more or less and to understand how it works. 99% of these guys, you know, they are just traditional business, right? Can be a somebody who wants to plant some tomatoes, you know, which is still traditional business, up to somebody who basically is a, you know, uh, produces paper, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And the newcomers, they don't have cash to pay let's say that learning curve and they don't have the knowledge now if we can project them right like steroids into a six month uh, let's say learning curve that at the end they at least know how to make the decisions they don't need to know how to execute it in detail and they suddenly are able to get a profitable business more or less in six months whatever it is and that that, that money comes flowing in right then also investors are more excited to look at, at them because nowadays investors essentially, not all of them, but they want to do risk control, right? I am as an investor, I can see both sides, right? And they are completely desperate, you know? Um, entrepreneurs, they want to build and execute more or less and investors want to mitigate risk. So that, that's the problem. And uh, if you can come up to an investor and you show them that you are you know, running and that you are generating those that, that cash, you know, on a daily basis, then suddenly that risk is mitigated in such a fashion that you come into an investment criteria. Okay, so everything more or less is uh, is, is uh, combined. So if you have those small industries, right? I always say you can have one big industry, or you can have a thousand small industries together. It's still a big industry. And, you know, I would like to leave it like that and hear about what the other panel members uh, would like to see uh, on that point. That's, that's great. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Gary, I want to come down to you. Anything else to add with Jose and, and Keith, but also artificial intelligence. I mean, what's happening now, uh, as, as I mentioned with Keith around uh, manufacturing, what's happening now with AI that we're planning for for the future that we can start investing in, we can start building in uh, before well, I mean, we get to the areas of opportunity? Is, you know, first of all, you know, Kyle, the number one article I've written was in Forbes. I never thought it would be on deep learning and machine learning because you would think the people like, this is like, you know, they would know, right? The challenge right. is they don't understand. So we got to start with, you know, you know, square one is, is okay, here's what AI is on supervised AI, semi-supervised AI, very VAE, you know, knowledge graphs, clusters, just basic. Because we don't understand. I mean, they use the people use the terms, but honestly, I mean, I've heard some pretty educated folks tell me stories, right? So right. one is education, defining what it is. The other thing is these companies that don't, 
implement it. So let's talk about it. What is it all about? It's all about the data, right? Mm -hmm. People say, so AI is the electricity, data is the fuel or the power plant, and then 5G, 6G is really the turbocharger for the system. And those are the kind of things that we need to have in place. So keeping it simple. So these plants, what, what they need to do, they understand that they need to be integrated. Imagine, as Keith said, you know, so now you've got decentralized plants that are now able to talk to each other. And when I've just, you know, recently have seen Magna's uh, automated vehicle, self-driving car, I mean, it's totally uh, self-driving. So it picks you up, reconfigures. I've, I've told you it's incredible. It reconfigures itself, could pick up parts from a plant, take them to another plant or hyperloop them over to a plant. So the technologies, I mean, the thing is the speed of change right now. And it's, I get a lot of people reaching out to me, companies around the world reaching out to me about AI. And they say, what do I need to do? And my last presentation was called uh, Do It or Die. Because it's that profound for these companies. This digital transformation is upon us. These factories need to understand that it's not about, I had, I'll never forget, I went into a plant one time and this uh, CEO of one of the largest companies in the world was with me on the tour. And, he, and they were making noise. This was a uh, printing, they were stamping uh, bases. And it was going click, cling, click, cling. And he said, now that's manufacturing. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I, was, I was shaking my head. And I was looking at that, that. And I said, well, how old is this machine? He said, it's 40 years old, literally. And the thing is, we need to understand that we, these companies want to stay in business are going to need to update and configure very, very quickly. They're going to need, be able to need to print parts very quickly. So those carbon printers like we have, it's changing everything, uh, construction, manufacturing, et cetera. So it's all about the uh, going back to the data. So the data is critically important. We're inundated with data. So getting the data is one thing, understanding the data is another thing, but making decisions and having this, the system make a decision for us make it intelligent is really where we need to go. So it's not just about collecting all the data from all the these sensors and IoT devices. Um, it's about what decisions we make. And remember, it's not about the quality of the model. It's about the quality of the data. That's a, that's absolutely spot on. And I want to come to the areas of opportunity as we're coming close to the top of the hour here. I mean, where should people be investing? Where should people be focusing? Where are the gaps that are being missed? And, uh, you know, Keith, I want to come to you on this next is where, where are those areas of opportunity right now? I mean, again, we talked about what you're investing in today and what not to be looking at for the future, but where, where are those opportunities right now that people should be really putting their time and effort into or money? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there are great opportunities to be investing in the kind of sensors that make this possible. But I've talked about this before, a business model is really critical here. And if all you're doing is selling sensors, selling hardware, then it's just widget selling and you are going to be limited in terms of setting your pricing. You are always going to be squeezed on your margins, et cetera. I think that the way that Gary invests is the smarter way to do it. If you're going to invest in these kind of sensor companies, these kind of robotic companies, et cetera, you have to make sure there is a data play. Unless the, that sensor company is controlling its data and ideally the AI or machine learning that is uh, driving the value that, deri that is derived from the use of those sensors, their ability to set their prices and defend their margins will be forever limited. But if they can structure their business as a service model where they are providing value to their customers on an ongoing basis through this data, through the analysis of the data, through the actionability of that data, uh, their customers are in the black from day one and are willing to pay because they see the value and it's not just buying a widget. So um, uh, that is where I would invest in this space is companies that not only have these sensors, but are going those few more steps along the value chain to create a service that uh, makes the information from those, uh, from those sensors actionable. I love it. Uh, Jose, to you, areas of opportunity, where should, be people be where should people be focusing their time, energy, and money? 
Yeah, I think today we have a fantastic synergy because uh, Gary kicked off with something which was very important and Keith picked it up and uh, and I'm, I'm going to keep, pick up where Keith left. And basically uh, he, he said something which is very, very crucial. And that's where we uh, more or less come in. So um, Gary said the data that you need to run all that, right? To, to, to sustain it. And then Keith said, well, but you don't, if you don't have the adequate business plan, if people don't want it, right? And you don't have the data on that, you know, you're basically not able to sell because there's no market fit, okay? So where we come exactly in is in that stage. In the first stage, when you need to uh, learn how to understand that market fit and adapt, and in the last stage, which is the real-time environment, okay, how are you going to really test it and get it to the market. So that, that's in essence what we do now. Still in the whole process, either what Gary says or what Keith says or what we say, right? It still needs artificial intelligence, machine learning, because there is no way that you can treat the amount of data that is put to you, right? In a human fashion, no way. So the, 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 the trend is exactly this, this, this row that we have uh, talked about now for the last five minutes. And um, people need to come up with things and test uh, if, if there is a market fit and if people do, do really want to have it and if their business model really is adaptable to the market because how sexy it is, right? If people don't want to have it, forget it. There's no way you're going to get it to the market. Agreed. Gary, uh, to you, areas of opportunity that people should be paying attention to. Other, I mean, they've said a lot mentioned. of the areas, right? It's uh, from my standpoint, as I said, security is critically important. And as these systems get up to speed and, uh, you know, a whole lot of different parts of the manufacturing floors become vulnerable, we need to look at the cybersecurity and how we actually protect those devices. So in the interim, Artificial intelligence can help because it can predict where the vulnerabilities will be. And it's critically important to look at those type of systems. But, you know, in the future, uh, quantum computing is going to be the next level because I'm not sure it'll be cybersecurity in the present form. In fact, I'm sure it won't be because it's going to be changing so quickly. You'll need two systems to be able to counteract each other. It'll be like dueling quantum computers. So, but then that's not that far in a distant future, just so we know, right? So, but in the interim, uh, artificial intelligence will be able to predict where the vulnerabilities are and then just make sure that, you know, that the right checks are uh, uh, put in place and you've got your chief security officers on top of it throughout the plan. And then how are they communicating with one another? Think about it, Kyle. I mean, plants will be communicating with, oh, I've got this done. Please send the truck over. The truck comes over. It's a self-driving truck, picks up the parts, automatically loaded onto the uh, truck, right? Sent over or hyper-looped over. And it, it's going to be, in, it's incredible, actually. I mean, think about it. There's going to be very few people on a manufacturing floor anymore. A few people potentially to oversee things, uh, but it's going to be an incredible, it's not like it was right? Where you had uh, somebody at General Motors at each one of the stops where they're doing some part of the manufacturing process. Those days are gone. Mm -hmm. couldn't, couldn't, couldn't agree more. Uh, oh, sorry, Keith, go ahead. You had a comment. Oh, sorry. I just had to agree with Gary so much. I had to say something. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Always room for that here on BCTV. And, and with that, I want to come to each of you for closing thoughts. And then again, where can everyone find you? to continue the conversation because there's so much more we can talk about here, but we're almost out of time. So I want to make sure that uh, uh, you guys get those closing thoughts in and then everyone can uh, continue the conversation. Jose, to you, quick closing thoughts, and then where can everyone find you online to continue the conversation? So the, the closing thoughts are the following. So wh wherever vertical you look in or whatever piece uh, that touches today, uh, humanity, doesn't matter if it's healthcare, you know, government or production or whatever it is, Definitely uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, that's the hit. So that's, that's where the money will lie in the next uh, 10 years. Uh, also the, the speed, but the speed I, I'm less concerned about uh, because we still have a, a huge problem to solve. Although the, the speed is improving, we still are working with technology in the telecom companies, you know, the, the, the uh, receivers, right? It still is very, very patched up, very old. 
So one day they, they will need to replace it, but they don't do it because there is a huge uh, investment to be done you know, in, into those towers that they don't want to do. So probably we will face this for another five years. So anything that's related to, to those three areas, definitely there's a lot of money to be made. Um, my point is that I'm always saying, you know, I'm focused on a niche, which is a very big niche. And the niche is two in every 10 guys, right? needs to get into business inclusion. Now, this is worth more or less almost $20 trillion every year on a global scale, right? And the, the, the smallest niche in that, that amount of, of money is more or less four to $6 trillion, right? And in essence, nobody is tackling it. So the market is completely open. So you can find me on uh, uh, LinkedIn, which is, would be uh, the best place on the Jose Grasa or Biz Money. Uh, but uh, you can also uh, push here on VCTV, you know, and uh, and get in touch with you. So there's an option for that. And um, I'm an open networker. So in essence, you know, I'm all, all ears. So uh, please uh, do and uh, get in touch with me. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, Keith, closing thoughts. Where can everyone find you? Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, this has been a great discussion today. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn or you can follow me on Twitter at Keith A. Gillard. Uh, the, the name of my new company is Upper Stage Ventures. The website is upperstage.ventures, but it's pretty stealthy. Um, like I said, we're investing in uh, companies impacting supply chain. And then this is a place where Industry 4.0 plays a big, big role. Um, we're looking at opportunities in, in logistics, um, in manufacturing, um, and of course, in the software that uh, will allow these things to transition uh, into the future, um, uh, enabling a lot of value uh, for, for all the shareholders and, and I think for society as a whole. So very excited about that. Um, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Last but not least, Gary, close us out. Where can everyone find you? But more importantly, your closing thoughts. Yeah. So, I mean, this is uh, data, data, data. And artificial intelligence is here to stay. Look at the technologies. Look at this unsupervised, semi-supervised AI systems. And remember, it's all about the training sets. If you don't have good training sets, the same AI can be used in different vertical markets. It's a matter of the training sets. So you can reach me on Twitter. You can reach me on LinkedIn, Gary Fowler. Uh, you can send me an email, Gary at gsdvs.com. I love to hear from you. GSD is a premier AI venture studios. We curate companies from around the world using Silicon Valley as a port to be able to, we are truly unicorn breeders. I mean, that's what we like and we've done two of them. So uh, love to hear from you. That's it, Kyle. Thank you. Wonderful. And, and guys, all thank you so much for, for your time today and sharing your thoughts and insights to you, our audience. Definitely check out each and every one of our investors online. Definitely reach out. Make sure you add context. Thank you, Gary, to where you met them, what you heard them speak on, and what you want to continue the conversation with uh, as well for each of them, as they all are busy, but would love to hear from you. And also a big thank you for tuning in. If you like what you heard, click subscribe, give us a thumbs up, do reach out. If you're an investor and would like to be on a show like today, joining Jose, Keith, and Gary or other investors and panels that we have. Also, thank you, Keith. Also, as entrepreneurs, if you'd like to be on here, as Jose mentioned, you want to get up here, you want to get on the virtual stage, pitch us, get feedback, start building uh, introductory relationships with each and every one of us, but also get exposure to our live audience. Do reach out to the team and or myself. Love to find the right spot for you. With that, a big thank you to the LA Token team and to Maria for making VCTV possible every single day. I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott. You can find me along with all of our investors online 24-7, 365 